Welcome back to Lockhorns Banger TV's weekly live metal debate show. If you're watching this in the archive, a reminder that we do go live every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. And please subscribe to Banger Team uh, TV. We're trying getting over the 100,000 mark uh, this year. Well, a lot of you have been asking about a genre that we haven't touched on yet on the show, and that is post metal. And because I know next to nothing about post metal, joining me here in the studio is the one, the only John Semley. Welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, good to see you again. You may remember that John joined us for Doom Metal, and I'll warn you, or perhaps prepare you, no, Nick Sewell is not lurking. Yeah, in Nick, the Nick Sewell uh, <laughs> ran in and tried to tell me that Candlemass wasn't a Doom band. Yeah. Um, God bless him. And yeah. He didn't get treated so well for that. But anyways, we're on to uh, different uh, different topics today. Uh, what have you been up to? What have I been up to? Uh, not much. Work as a freelance writer. Maybe Jermaine. I'm teaching a class on horror films now. That's cool. Maybe I'll be the first person to link uh, horror movies and metal. Uh, just yeah. kidding, of course. <laughs> uh, and yeah, published a book recently. And uh, yeah, mostly come here as a big metal fan, I guess. Rarely get the opportunity to write about it. Yep. Uh, but this is exciting. Yeah, it is exciting because, you know, I'm going to need your help today. What appeals to you? We'll get into what post metal is but just more on a visceral level the fan in you what do you like about this stuff right well i'll say this like my favorite metal shows are shows where i can go to them and i don't have to go with anyone else and i can just like put my hood up and like close my eyes right. and sort of go on a weird journey in my brain uh -huh. uh, sonically. Uh, and I get that at a lot of post metal shows. Uh, right. As someone who spends a lot of time alone working from home, I think it's like good music that's kind of ambient, uh, but then also sort of drags you in and gets right. you banging your head. Uh, there's a lot of that sort of dynamism between the loud parts and the quiet parts. Right. Um, part of what I like about it is that, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about this of course, sure. the genre as it is, is like, so kind of amorphous and ambiguous mm -hmm. uh, that there's many things to like about it and yeah. many more things to like about it as it kind of keeps evolving. Cool. Well, as you know, there's a lot of debate about this particular style of metal. Uh, people have been on the chat board uh, for a while now, uh, you know, so right. both the detractors and the supporters yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of all things post-metal. And as you all know, uh, Lockhorns is not just about us up here, it's about everyone out there. We wanna hear uh, what you think about Post Metal. And I wanna give a shout out to everyone who's joining us for Lockhorns today. And we're gonna start with our regulars who we've actually nicknamed the Horsemen because there's four of them. Uh, and they are Arthur Felipe Castana from Lisbon, Horror Master from Laredo, Texas, uh, Delicious Dishes, and Raphael Fireblade, they should definitely start a power metal band yeah. uh, with those uh, monikers, but they are officially now nicknamed uh, the Four Horsemen of Lock Horns. Welcome back and onwards. Uh, we got Jackson Kelly from Starkville, Mississippi, Mr. Josh Littles, downtown Toronto, 1MQ, Columbia, Carna Verde, San Francisco, Mikhail Lopez from Ven Venezuela, uh, Nikki J, Michigan, Leonard Reinstein, New York. Uh, heavy Metal Heretic is at Mount Forest Bitches. That's just up the road. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Mount Forest Bitches has ever been uttered in that way. Diana Klein, Denmark. Elad Zalman from Israel. Uh, Evaldas from Lithuania. Uh, James Lavario is joining us from Austin, uh, Texas. Uh, first time in the live stream. Uh, welcome to all of you. And as always, we don't just want to hear about your favorite bands that are post-metal, but we want to hear sensible, well-articulated reasons why you think a particular band should or should not be part of the post-metal conversation and talk about rules. Lisa Latisor is in, in the studio with us and she is uh, equipped with uh, the now officially named Cowbell from Hell. It's the Cowbell from Hell. <laughs> And hopefully I won't have to use it, but uh, I have a feeling that Please I, use will, it. I will have to use it. The sound is so bracing. Samley's in the room. You're definitely going to have to use the cowbell from hell. Nick, anyway. Nick Sewell. This is honorary <laughs> Nick Sewell. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's, let's, let's get started uh, on this, uh, John. Uh, when we say pa, post-metal, uh, what comes to mind? What are the characteristics of this? Well, I think it makes sense to talk about post-metal. Again, as you sort of said, a lot of people debate, is this a genre? Would a band ever call themselves a post-metal band? Mm -hmm. 
I don't think so. But the job of journalists or metal anthropologists is to sort of make up all these categories. Uh, and I think post-metal originates in its way from post-rock, uh, which is a term from the early 90s, I think a critic named Simon Reynolds mm. in Britain came up with, to refer to bands like Mogwai, like Tortoise, Slint, Godspeed You Black Emperor, these bands who were sort of using rock instrumentation to do sort of more uh, ambient, exploratory, long compositions. Mm. And I think the easiest way to explain post-metal is that it's essentially that, but heavier. Got it. Uh, so it is to metal what post-rock is to rock. Right. Um, do we want to talk about why some people might find that insulting? Well, what 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 about it sonically? Like, there's a bit of a a, li a loud, quiet, loud yeah, thing yeah. here. I, loud, quiet, loud. I mean, that's an old sort of Pixies thing. Although, mm -hmm. incidentally, Pixies producer Steve Albini worked on a number of albums with Neurosis and go. a few other post-metal bands. But yeah, there's that dynamism between sort of loud, growling, riffy parts, sort of quieter, more ambient and exploratory parts, very long compositions. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find like a heavy use of like samples mm -hmm. not uncommon in metal especially doom metal you have stuff from horror movies and that but you know samples of like people talking about life being meaningless there's sort of an overriding pessimism i okay. think to the genre and as a fan i'd be the first to admit that it's like super duper pretentious like the lyrics are all like dense and ponderous right. uh all those things that some people find annoying but other people really like and very instrumental in the sense that there's a yeah. huge em emphasis as you say very long songs but long drawn out instrumental and, and complex maybe not in the sense of like prog metal or even in the sense of album or stuff where like the guitar solos are hyper technical or something like that right. but complex in the sense that the songs are put together in a way that feels like complex. structurally complex. structurally complex and maybe yeah. a riff that takes like a minute to execute There's yeah but it's not quite like sleep style <laughs> right, right you know stoner sludge right uh maybe there's some crossover. well we're gonna do something a little bit different uh this week we're gonna let some of the 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 board chime in on the characteristics of this style because uh, there's a lot of opinions out there. So here we got Kyle Kittleberger. Uh, what the hell is post-metal? Good start. That's what we're trying <laughs> to figure out today. Uh, Zedser says uh, post-metal is when you send someone a copy of metal record via mail. Oh, Do you have geez. a ring shot? Whoa, you can cowbell from hell. Uh, Chick. Metallica, I like that one. I am in the same boat as others. I really have no idea about post-metal bands. Okay, well that's why John's in the room. Alex Bananings Mannings says that post-metal is really still a fledgling genre. That being said, it's the emerging genre of this decade, much like thrash was in the 80s. Okay, extreme metal in the 90s. That's interesting. Jamie Wolanski says, I'm pretty good with metal genres, but what the fuck is post-metal? Ha <laughs> ha. I've heard the term post-hardcore, post-metalcore, but straight up post-metal, huh? Delicious dishes. I think we should separate all the post-black metal stuff that is all the rage these days. I would honestly advocate to put post-black metal with wolves in the throne room, Alcest, uh, Agaloc, and all the black gays kids in a separate category. I agree. Yeah. Uh, Mikhail Lopez, uh, post-metal, as black metal is one of the of the few metal genres where the feeling is more important than the virtuosity. Good point. And lastly, Heavy Metal Heretic says that post-metal is a name that insults metal. Ouch. It is a genre uh, that magazine critics love because they think it's not metal. A more fitting name is avant-garde metal. It is a combination of prog metal and alternative but rock. But I will say for the record, I like metal. Like, I'm not here to just talk about just, post metal. Just took two minutes to start bashing <laughs> journalists here. Here Fuck we go. <laughs> um, but, I mean, okay, so as a counterpoint to that, yes. I admit, okay, this post metal thing is obnoxious. Aaron Turner from ISIS, who runs Hydra Head Records, once called post metal thinking man's metal, which is sort of means that you know like you're a knuckle dragger or you're a dummy if you like any other type of metal I don't think that's true at all. I right. would never say anything like that. Most of the smartest people I know who like metal, their favorite bands are like Death and Morbid Angel and stuff. Right. Has nothing to do with like your literal intelligence, I don't think. Right. Um, but yeah, I can see why some people do find it insulting. Uh, but at the same time, yes, it does draw in people who aren't necessarily interested in metal. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a good example, for example, a good example. Both of them. Was the, uh, uh, a couple years ago in Montreal, they did Godspeed You Black Emperor right. Neurosis co-headlining shows. Right. That is like a bill that may seem kind of weird, but they share a lot of DNA. So like you may get like, 
the sort of hipster anarchist sad kids come in for Godspeed right. and maybe stick around for neurosis. Right. Um, but the odd thing is Metallica can play with Ylang Lang and it's still okay. Yeah, or like, Weird. you know, the Melvins anyway. can tour with Mel Banana and Napalm Death. Right, right. There's so much crossover in this. Sure. If you look at the bills for sure. any like decibel tour, sure. there's so much crossover and stuff sure. that I don't think it matters. Well, I, we were talking about before we went live, you know, it might not be the music per se that uh, where the objection lies here, but rather the term the that's been yeah, used yeah, yeah, because yeah. Post metal, just that phrase can suggest so many things, I yeah. suppose. And here I think it's we, loaded. Here I think we get into the sort of hairier definition of it. Like A, I think it's as good a definition as any other. Uh, you know, it's like describing that joke about an elephant. It's hard to describe, but you know it when you see it. Right. A post metal band, it's hard to describe, but you know it when you hear it. But avant-garde yeah. metal was presented. I mean, is that does that work for you? Well, I mean, if we start want if we want to get into like the family tree a bit, right? Like, I think that do we want to talk about the legend? Am I going off script? We're gonna get there. Let's okay, go to the okay, legend. Okay. Let's ring the bell. Sorry. From hell. Legend. <laughs> I feel legend? Like what a surprise. Circling around it. Okay. Standard procedure here at Lock Horns is uh, to sort of set some ground rules. We like to choose the band without which this would not exist. The right. band that sort of sets it off, the band that really cannot be put anywhere else on the heavy metal uh, family tree, that band for you is? Yeah, Neurosis. I've mentioned them a bunch of times, obviously. Uh, in a way, it's like, you know, I've heard someone say, what is post-metal? Well, it's a term to describe neurosis. Right. Uh, so I think they sort of set a template that a lot of other people followed. Okay. Again, the slippery slope with this is you're talking about music that does experiment and does sort of innovate constantly. Yeah. So it simultaneously doesn't make sense to say they set a template when everyone's fiddling with that template. Right. But Neurosis is a band, I assume most people know them. I should think so. From the Bay Area, they started as sort of a hardcore, post-hardcore maybe band. Yeah. And then with uh, their album Souls at Zero, they started moving into this sort of more exploratory, more heavy metal territory. Uh, and the reason why I think that they're the legend, beyond the fact that they have like six masterpiece albums, right. through Silver and Blood, Enemy of the Sun, yeah. Times of Grace, um, they didn't really come from a metal background. They right. came from more of that hardcore background right. and then started doing something totally different. Right. It was tied to sludge metal, perhaps. That's mm -hmm. another sort of thing when we talk about a lot of, especially American post-metal, I think it is very rooted in sludge, in right. that sort of growly, almost death metal-y sound. Right. Okay. Uh, which explains why people want to split off Black Gaze into its own thing. Right. But yeah, Neurosis are the total legends. Another way to describe post-metal is bands that sound like Neurosis. All right, well, we didn't do an episode on post metal for Metal Evolution. However, uh, recently I did get a chance to sit down with Neurosis and ask them about this term post metal and what they thought. Here we go. He created this insane thing called the heavy metal family tree. You guys don't fit anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but people use this word and it's not on our chart. So I guess we're going to have to add something called post metal. Okay? Post metal. We've heard that term. We've heard metal gaze, we've heard post hardcore, we've heard art metal. Who fucking cares? Yeah, it's all stupid. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I never even heard the term cave. post metal until like I was like reading a review of us one like years ago and I said post metal, what the hell is that? You People know, are trying to invent stuff. I mean I would I wouldn't want to have this kind of Except for hubris, <laughs> but I mean yeah. you could put neurosis as a genre on that chart. If you want. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, if, yeah. if you can. Just off the side. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. I've never met a band that likes a category, but, you know, obviously Neurosis there, kind of not entirely comfortable with, with being tagged a, a At the same time, Jason Roter there at the end kind of makes my point uh, right. where he's like, well, if you want to just put a branch on the heavy metal family tree for Neurosis, right. go nuts. Well, it's and a very good... This is that branch. And perhaps. in fact, you know, we probably take a look at the tree at large and find that that's the case with, with, with how this whole thing evolves. It, a band comes around that truly innovates and we got to we got to label it with something yeah. because inevitably that band goes on to influence a bunch of other bands and then it becomes a genre. So a Another yeah. thing I want to clarify too when I was talking about the early Neurosis albums I think someone might have pointed this out in the chat but they came out on alternative tentacles like Jello Biafra's label yeah. so even that is like a weird context like if you're a kid who's buying magazine right. or tapes at the time I guess or CDs sure. out of the back of a catalog and you're expecting this sort of like West Coast hardcore thing and 
then you get souls at zero. Like I could, but there's a little before my time, but I could sure. imagine that being yeah. totally mind blowing. And further to that, you know, it's not coming from Metal Blade or Earache exactly. or, or exactly. Peaceville, so it's kind of already coming from yeah. outside Side of genre, the kind yeah. of the the metal scene. Uh, we do have some comments here about Neurosis. Sure. Yes, Lisa. Yeah, there's no locking of horns on this one. Okay, okay. here we go. Raphael Fireblade one. Of the Four Horsemen says Neurosis album through Silver and Blood was the first official album in post metal mixing progressive avant garde sludge folk alternative metal elements with yelling and dark vocals. Uh, Artur, uh, also a member, uh, says that Neurosis are on one of the most consistent bands not only of this genre but of sludge with a lot of influence in most other bands. Jason Vegan adds. But Neurosis is so much more than just post-metal. They incorporate Doom, Sludge, Drone, so sort of suggesting that post-metal is limit limiting, I suppose. And Heavy Metal Heretic says, everyone arguing for Neurosis is like advocating Black Sabbath for Doom Metal. It's going to be up there, focus on other bands. Happy to. Well, should we move on to some other but bands? But if I may address that one point, that thing that they're more than post-metal because they incorporate Sludge, Drone, Doom. Yep. I think it is that incorporation and that synthesis which sort of describes what post metal is. Right. So I think the fact that they do wear all these different hats right. uh, sort of speaks to them being post metal. There you go. It doesn't. It's not simple here today on post metal. No. Yes, Lisa. No one is arguing that neurosis belongs on this chart. No right. one is arguing against, against that. Against it. Yeah. But a few people do take issue with them being the legend. They believe that there is another strong candidate. Okay. And it that is. ISIS. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. VTX. ISIS is the root of all post -metal. We're talking about the band ISIS, by the way, not the Islamic State. Correct. Okay, all right. We yeah. should be absolutely clear about that. <laughs> Mikhail Lopez, Oceanic uh, by ISIS is the definition of the genre. Truly remarkable album with heavy riffs, a lot of atmosphere, and the hardcore influence in the vocals. Uh, Miguel Rivero says the best fucking post metal band is ISIS, no question. Horror Master, ISIS is the legend, end of discussion, and M A D A, ISIS, not what you think cemented the sound for modern post metal and and would not be as popular uh, without them well we've got an isis magnet so of course give me your thoughts on isis john isis great band as everyone's saying totally a seminal band came about i don't know seven six or seven years later than neurosis right. to get back to that black sabbath analogy that someone made uh yeah black sabbath would be like the starting of doom metal but they weren't calling themselves doom metal like by the time isis came along there was already a bit of a template that sure. had been established for post metal right. thanks to these gentlemen up here right uh so yeah isis totally legendary band again i think i mentioned aaron turner from isis whose record label hydra head is another good sort of category what's a post metal band any band on Hydra Head Records. Right. Um, so you're making the argument, big head start here. Are you making the argument there would be no ISIS if it wasn't for Neurosis? I mean, who's to say? But yeah. I, I, I do think that like they, they, it's impossible to say for sure, but I doubt <laughs> that they would sound like they did without Neurosis. Right. You know, ISIS is obviously a huge, important, amazing band. People have mentioned records like Oceanic or Panopticon, incredible albums. Uh, to my taste, it's almost like a bit too atmospheric. Uh, there's a bit more sort of push and pull in Neurosis that I tend to respond to a bit more. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, you'll get no argument from me about ISIS being a legendary okay. post-metal band. Well, we're going to leave Neurosis at the top as the legend, despite the comments there. overrule all these people. Uh, oh, we just overruled. We can, <laughs> yeah. we can pull hierarchy here in, in, in the banger bar. But ISIS, obviously very important. Now, Lisa, we've got some other band ads. First, more love for ISIS because there's so much of it. Okay, Boston Stump says Aaron Turner equals God. Uh, Michael L. Krusty, ISIS album Oceanic is the epitome of post metal. And Eva Rodbro says uh, ISIS is awesome. One of my favorite bands. Good to know. MADA is back. ISIS Celestial is one of the most important albums for this subgenre and is the blueprint for post metal. So it's, uh, it's interesting here. Like, there's people maybe not disputing that Neurosis maybe kind of kick-started it, but yeah. the strong opinion that there's something about ISIS that sort of crystallizes what this represents to them. For I sure. Know. I mean, yeah. uh, ISIS is more uncomplicatedly post-metal, uh -huh. I guess. Right. Uh, Less debate. Yeah, I mean, that, that conversation in that interview that you had with Neurosis, I doubt you would get the same pushback from Aaron Turner. Right. Uh, right. Especially because right. like, he's the one who's like, it's taking man's metal. Like, it seems to embrace it as much as anyone embraces any label. Right, right. Fair enough. Uh, and Lisa, do we, uh, do we move on to more bands now or have we got more ISIS 
on the board. Of course we, we move on. Okay. It's uh, time. Uh, this is a band I had never heard of before we did this show. Uh -huh. And some people want to talk about Pelican. Pelican. Here we go. Alejandro Ochoa uh, says that Pelican is another band that should be considered in the post-metal category. It has been a constant band since 2001 with staple albums of the genre like Australasia and The Fire in Our Throats Will Beckon the Thaw. Uh, it's as important as Isis and Neurosis. They even share stages and festivals. They are the definitive sound of this movement. Mikhail Lopez uh, says that Pelican deserves a shout. Their instrumental approach truly relies on the focus on the genre and their influence uh, from post-rock. We've got a Pelican magnet. Again, hard to argue with yep. from my point of view. Pelican is sort of where you might get more divisive in the sense of like the music attracting people who don't listen to metal because as someone pointed out, it is instrumental music. Mm -hmm. uh, it is heavy, it is exploratory, it is all these things, hmm. but it's sort of, uh, you know, kind of movie soundtrack music for very right. cool movies that don't exist yet. Right, right. Um, but yeah, that that is maybe where you might get people who are like, oh, well, I like the sound of this, but like the growly vocals are so scary. Uh, I don't right. know who this character is that I'm imagining who would right. say that. Uh, but yeah, Pelican for sure an important band. And I think even the idea of being like an instrumental metal band is itself... Well, I was just thinking that, yeah, struggling to think of another instrumental only metal band that would be sort of considered important to a genre. It's almost like by being an instrumental exactly. metal band, yeah, which yeah. is, I think, what you're saying kind of makes them a. You, you, you wouldn't find it anywhere yeah, else. They're like post metal without all those nasty metal parts. Ew, yeah, they're like the stuff. Hamilton of post metal, you know? It's oh. like rap music without all the rap. Shout out to Hammertown there. Here we <laughs> no, go. No, I meant Hamilton the musical, oh. not the city, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> we got another band here. We got Cult of Luna, Hannah Klein. Cult of Luna must be on there. The Swedes have released countless flawless records that bear the torch of everything that's essential in the world of post-metal, experimenting with post-rock, shoegaze, doom, sludge, atmospheric, and progressive elements, as well as exploring sensitive and complex topics such as male loneliness. Ooh, very unmetal. Of which I'm and very on, familiar. On, <laughs> on their masterpiece, you with your hood on at the, at the Neurosis Show. <laughs> uh, somewhere along the highway, they are still growing strong. Song, lastly proven on their collaboration Mariner with Julie Christmas and Diz Chu says Cult of Luna to me is Megadeth uh, is Megadeth to Isis Metallica I think I get that I was wearing a Megadeth shirt earlier <laughs> uh, I didn't think they would come up in this episode <laughs> maybe not as popular but arguably as influential in Carne Verde Cult of uh, Luna definitely and Casio Core I like that uh, Cult mm. of Luna's lyrics are great and not depressing crap like you usually hear in uh, post metal. So, Cult of Luna, what's your opinion? Again, this is so, such a friction free episode, I feel. Cult I know, of we're Luna. We're just cruising. Well, here. we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Cult of Luna, an amazing band. I've sort of sometimes cheaply called them like the European Neurosis. Uh, even as recently as like Vertical that I think came out in 2002, such an amazing album, super long compositions where they're experimenting with like electronics. Uh, again, totally. Valid, good pick. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say no, but I, uh, maybe I'm too much of a fan. It's actually, you know? well, it's interesting. There's not so much uh, contentiousness around who belongs, but again, this Where title. Where they belong. Yeah, yeah. It's this title people struggle with. Yes, Lisa? We're going to get to Death Haven, and we're going to get to Deftones. Oh, boy. And we may even get to Tool, and people are going to argue a lot. Deftones? Who's saying the Deftones? Okay. But first, we have the guest choice we have. Oh, the we guest selected choice. Yet. This will be controversial. Well. Because I'm basically ab yes. abusing my privilege as a guest <laughs> to, like, canonize a band. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people would call this band post-metal. Actually, someone has it up there. The Body. I love The okay, Body. Yeah. Uh, they're new. They're like, to me, The Body and Sleaford Mods are like the two ber best bands that exist these days. Yeah. One of them is like a British rap band, but regardless. Uh, more sludgy, more doomy, but certainly experimental and loud, really droney really like to talk about those depressing lyrics like the most depressing lyrics right. to the point where i sometimes think they're like making a parody of the genre right their right. last album which was amazing was called nobody deserves happiness and it was on this like goofy pink cover yeah. but it was, it was one of natalie zed's favorite of uh 2016, yeah me too so, yeah 100 yeah, percent. like such a great band uh do they sound much like Isis or Neurosis or Pelican or Cult of Luna? Not really, but I think that the other thing with post-metal is just kind of this spirit of invention and of experimentation. Mm -hmm. They do all sorts of collaborative albums uh, with Full of Hell, with Thou, with bands like that. Uh, so yeah, again, to perhaps I'm abusing my privilege, 
People can tell me if that's the case. Well, what I'm gathering here from the layman's non-post metal <laughs> expert uh, Let me put on my mortar per, board. Per, per perspective is that, you know, traditionally there have been accepted genres outside of metal that metal bands have incorporated into the sure. music. You know, classical being the obvious one. Like, yeah. no one... You know, no one jumped up and down when Ride the Lightning started with an acoustic guitar oh, really? intro. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe at the time, but th there's these certain well, tropes. Iron Maiden like using Coleridge lyrics. Right, right, or, or or borrowing on on progressive, like speaking of, of, of Maiden, you know, borrowing from Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. you listen to those early records and you realize how much they were. T My point is, is that there have always been accepted right. non-metal genres that metal bands have drawn on. But I think what makes, th what I'm gathering here is that what post metal bands have done are perhaps adopting elements from non metal genres that are pretty unconventional. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like I say, electronic. I mean, I don't think borrowing from hardcore is like that unconventional. Right? Like, well, you yeah. know, there, there used to be the more of the schism between are you a punk or are sure. you a metal guy? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that exists anymore, right. maybe in the 80s. Right. Um, but yeah, certainly I think a good way to think about post metal is uh, it's got its fingers in many pies. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, and the body, I think, is a case of that. You know, would easily fit on a doom list or a drone list, uh, yeah. but would like to get them in here just because of that sort of willingness to bring in drone, doom, all those okay. things. Okay, some people have something to say. <laughs> Let the cowbell from hell rip. We got to hear that thing. Okay, the body. The body. We got a few comments. Okay, here. the body. Uh, Aggressive tendencies is back. The body have the best album right? titles. <laughs> you, you whom I have always hated is one. <laughs> one day you will ache like I ache. The cold, suffocating dark goes on forever and we are alone. That's that's pretty fucking great. And no one deserves happiness. These are these are happy people. They should but again, the, they, they are funny. Like there's a funniness to right, it. Like right. one of their band shirts like rips off the Grateful Dead skull logo and stuff. Like there's an extent to which it seems to be vaguely Monty Python going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, which as someone who let loves us wallow in our own yeah. uh, suffering and yeah. destitution. <laughs> Leonard Reinstein uh, Reepstein says that while do me, the body mixes in elements of drone and sludge. Their frequent collaborations with other bands allow them to explore a wide range of sonic territory while maintaining a core of crushing heaviness and negativity. That's a key word. Negativity. negativity. You don't actually hear that too often. Miguel Riveros, uh, the body are more sludge than post-metal, in my opinion, and delicious dishes, uh, also one of the four horsemen. Uh, the body could be argued to be post-metal, uh, but they are much different from the ones already on here. Good atmosphere, and they take the atmosphere of black metal with the heaviness of sludge further. Heavy metal heretic, the body, woot, and I'm not even going to read that one. The body is noise from Tech 3 to Techno man. And uh, man like grave worm, don't let them choose things on his own for fuck's sake. That's aimed at me. That's you. Well, fair enough. Okay. You can get up here and uh, do grave worm. things someday. Yeah, yeah, you can do post post metal. <laughs> yeah. That's even smarter. Yes. Nick Sewell, we know that's you <laughs> <laughs> under another name. Could we just call this sad metal? Yeah. It I is sad. It's sad metal. Well, that's okay. Being sad rules. Negativity metal. Yeah, it's like why, I don't know, music isn't like some uh, soma that you take to make you feel good all the time. Like sometimes it makes you feel bad, and that is itself cathartic. Unless it's Lorena McKinnon. But I digress. Do you like Lorena Le McKinnon? No. Uh, what? <laughs> Lisa, we going to uh, introduce uh, a slightly contentious band into the Yeah, mixer? so um, before we get to some of those D words, <laughs> the bad words on today's show, um, some people have mentioned Godflesh, right. uh, which we talked about in Industrial Metal yep. and um, also came up when I asked a local band, uh, Northumbria, who play a sort of ambient post-metal, for their pick of uh, who should be on the chart, and uh, that's what they had to say. So we've got a clip. Here we go. For me, the most influential and important post-metal bands in my life anyway would easily be Godflesh. They took the tools of metal, but stripped them down to their most brutal raw essence and created this monolithic power that was unheard of at the time and still hasn't really been paralleled, not in the same way anyway, drawing on all these different elements from experimental minimalist music to grindcore to industrial, even sometimes ambient. They created this singular vision that was terrifying but utterly cathartic to listen to and to listen through and powerful emotionally and hit you on this deep gut level 
and the records have aged incredibly well too. They're still some of the biggest influences in my life anyway, and still some of the heaviest records ever made for sure. So yeah, I mean, Godflesh is a band that tends to come up in a lot of conversations on sure. Lockhorns. They're like they're like an Opeth or a Devin Townsend. They kind of float around a few a, a few genres of metal. What's your thoughts there on on Godflesh? Well, uh, one quick thing. I noticed in the chat that someone called the body Leonard Cohen metal, which I thought was funny. Very nice. Uh, Godflesh. I love Godflesh. Amazing band. Uh -huh. But like, if you were to put a gun to my head and be like, "What subgenre is Godflesh?" I would say that they're an industrial band. Yeah, without right, thinking. Right. Like, uh, yeah, they're a bit sort of slower and more plodding, uh, a bit more atmospheric than a lot of industrial bands or industrial metal bands. I could see how people uh, could call them an influence, but. I can also see how that's a bit of a stretch. There's a lot of these bands from the 80s, that Melvins, I think, is another one right. that people often bring up to be like, oh, well, they were post-metal because we don't know what to call them. Right. Well, it's like that's not enough for me to say that they're a post-metal band. Sure. Uh, however, Godflesh is certainly relevant in the genealogy of post-metal because uh, the guy, what's his name, Justin Broderick? Justin Broderick, yeah. Yep. He from Godflesh is... Jezu, right. who I think Jezu is a rather more uncomplicatedly uh, post metal band. Right. Also, and like I'm not trying to be a flag waver or anything, but I think the origins of post metal it's like are very much an American phenomenon. Okay. So when you're talking about Cult of Luna or like British bands like mm -hmm. Godflesh mm -hmm. or Jezu, mm -hmm. it seems like a bit outside of it to me. Right. Uh, of course, now with the internet, that doesn't matter. But uh, so I would say Godflesh, like maybe if we want to put them up as like an antecedent, uh, but Jezu for sure. I mean, a lot of that music is like way out there. You know, with any number of these bands, there's records where you could say, this sounds like post-metal, this sounds like ambient. You know, a lot of these bands, like a lot of black metal bands, will just put out like ambient electronic yeah. spa metal albums. <laughs> we should do a spa metal tree. Negative spa metal. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Godflesh, if only because, you know, it, it seems to me like it's part of the genealogy. Mm -hmm. But again, gun to my head, I would not call them a post-metal There band. we go. You heard it here with Sam Lee. Uh, Lisa, we're going to add some other bands, though, or we're at least going to debate some bands. We are going to let the chat argue about where these bands belong. Okay. Well, we got, we got some comments about Godflesh first. We got Michael L. Krusty. I do not think Godflesh is post-metal delicious dishes. Godflesh are for sure influential, but I wouldn't say they fit here so well. A Broken Machine won We Need Godflesh. Alex Crew said Isis fucking covered Street Cleaner and it made sense. Isn't that enough? I would say it isn't. Uh, <laughs> Mikhail Lurksundi uh, said that Godflesh should be above all of these bands. Well, there you go. We're agreeing here. The man who deserved the legend label for the, or the first pioneer is Justin, Justin Broderick and Flugmorph, uh, undoubtedly a character on Game of Thrones, says that I would rather put uh, Godflesh than J Jezu on here, but Godflesh is industrial metal, so leave those Yeah, is Godflesh completely. on the industrial tree? Yes. Okay, so they're good. You can still listen to Godflesh. Nobody stopped. Ten you. years ago, we nailed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's actually 13, but who's dating ourselves? Uh, so, okay, this is a bit of a state of affairs here. Okay, I think we've got a pretty This is so solid. clean compared to the Doom it's one. So it's so clean. Like a dog's breakfast. It's so clean. <laughs> so we got a nice clean line here. You brought the body, uh, which, you know, uh, might be some debate around. And then, obviously, Godflesh maybe needs to be considered more of an antecedent uh, to post-metal rather than being a part of it. Now, Lisa... It's been pretty clean so far. Not a lot of locking horns, but uh, maybe that's coming. Well, uh, first, something uh, that is uh, less contentious. I mean, there's a ton of people in here arguing about the Deftones and Tool. It's like a whole separate thing going on. Okay. any conversation ever about music, people will just eventually start arguing about the Deftones and Tool. <laughs> right? We could be talking about Lorena McKennett, it would reduce and the Tool would come up. <laughs> yeah. But in between all of that, I'm finding, I'm still being able to find, uh, a lot of people want to talk about Russian circles. Russian circles. Landon Regner. Russian circles is definitely a must. Mike Sullivan is a killer guitarist and a god when it comes to layering and looping parts. Also, Brian played for Botch before uh, joining Russian circles. Uh, Ava Rodbro is back. Russian circles should also be on this list. They have been around for a very long time and their evolution through each album is sublime. Nicely put. Uh, and Quackadilly Blip, uh, Russian <laughs> circles, uh, not a post-metal band name, uh, has the key <laughs> characteristics of post-rock, but heavier 
warrior, to your point. That's the definition of the genre, and Russian circles fits it in like fits it like a punch to the face, bit more uh, in, instrumental. Though Oliver uh, Grunseis says that uh, Russian circles must be considered their most interesting, uh, in, their uh, most interesting instrumental band, along with If Trees Could Talk. They're the most interesting band in a long time. Uh, Clarence Dudley says Russian circles, Russian circles, Russian circles. I did say it three times as fast as I could. Maybe they'll appear. Tell me about this band. Uh, Russian circles, again, they're a band that I would sort of put here, at, uh -huh. like to the near to Pelican. Yep. Uh, again, certainly a thing that like draws in post-Rocky fans mm -hmm. uh, that is largely instrumental. But I agree with all the descriptions there about it being sublime, about their progression as especially a band that's like, well, a lot of these bands are still touring a lot. Um, they're amazing. They're a great band. Mm -hmm. Again, when I was talking about those shows you can go to where you just put your hood up and sort of close your eyes, Russian Circles is like that par excellence, uh, very happy to have them up here. Uh, but again, you, you know, you get into the point where it's like a bit of the sort of softer, more atmosphere, rain drizzling on a tin roof type vibe uh, than heavier bands on the list, but, but that's fine. So are they metal? I think I think so. Okay. Yeah. I mean, right. I, I think it's just like, got to make sure that yeah. they fit in the room to begin with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I think as much as Pelican is, I mean, I think they're actually more interesting than Pelican. Okay. Uh, Pelican's a bit more legendary, I guess. But yeah, extremely happy to have Russian circles cool. on there. Learning something new as we go here. Lisa, anyone else or any more on, on Russian circles? No, I think Russian circles make the cut, but uh, let's do this Deftones oh thing. Oh boy, Deftones. Yeah. One band I never imagined we would talk about today. But anyway, here we go. Thrash Maniac 99. One could argue that Deftones should be added from the White Pony album to present day since they evolved their sound by incorporating soundscapes and atmosphere into their music. I don't think anyone would dispute that. Uh, Noah Rodriguez, however, you cannot defy that Deftones have been an influential band in the genre since the White Pony era and has continued to master their craft in the genre thanks to albums like Deftones, Saturday Night Fever, and recently Gore. The band has hit all the hallmarks of post-metal, including, but not limited to, Nice academic moment there. <laughs> Dramatic dynamic changes, shoegazing atmospheres, lengthy compositions, and a natural tendency to create something more of an artistic statement. That's loaded. Uh, Joe Cabrera says, uh, deaf tones suck. <laughs> so they should be put on this list. Ouch! Oh, man. Well, I got. Uh, I don't think that they're a post metal band. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I would lock horns on that. But I'll be honest. Uh, you know, I've ne never been the biggest Deftones fans at all. Right. Uh, so maybe that doesn't make. As post a teenager, metal. when everyone was into it, it was stuff that I like actively disliked. Uh -huh. So maybe I'm coming at it from a certain bias, but I don't think they fit the bill. Well, oddly, this is the band on this board that I probably know best, albeit only really isolated to a couple of albums yeah. a long time ago with Around the Fur and White Pony. I mean, Gore was a super regret. interesting album, but uh -huh. again, like when I listened to it, I like when, never occurred to me that it was a post metal album or anything like that. Right. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Craig Mailman, no idea. Let's get security here. Says <laughs> Deftone songs are too structured, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Yeah, I would chorus. agree with that. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit like. Radio rocking. conventional, yeah. I mean, concerning in, in, the type in of a bands song that we're talking about, nothing wrong yeah. with conventional song structure no, or anything like no. that. But but there's something, the type of stuff we're as you said about. at the outset, a key characteristic is not complexity necessarily in terms of like look at how fast it can play the solo, but more in terms of a song structure. Exactly. Complexity. Yeah. So yeah. I'm happy to leave them in the side or in the bin altogether. All right. Well, Craig Mailman <laughs> running the show here, uh, and John Samley both. Uh, holding their ground, saying that Deftones are not a post-metal band. Lisa? Yeah, with apologies to our friend Thrash Maniac 99 and, and some of the other commentators, uh, it's overwhelmingly a no for the Deftones. Like, they're the a new metal band, are they not? Like, is that not what the Deftones are? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's, that's a debate for another day, my friend. Okay, where are we going next? It's a lot of um, bands like... That, like have one or two comments okay. so I thought we'll read some and get John's take on it how about sure. that sure okay okay Adam uh, Portier says burst needs to make it on the board their first album was released in 1995 way before right. Isis or Cult of Luna back when this genre was just music that sounds like uh, neurosis what I, about uh, what I agree but it's like I just don't think they made enough of an impact yep. um, so I don't know. I mean, again, you can put any number of bands on here 
right. uh, because they are post metal bands. Well, but we'll I, put them on the board since they came up. But sure. you don't think you don't I, think I, I wouldn't post-metal. put them at a family tree. Like no offense to the person who suggested them, because like I don't think they either invent invented or reinvented the genre enough, or sort of have that heft in terms of their catalog and their reputation to okay. necessarily marry it, merit it. Mm. Uh, so okay, let's move on. Flood morph. Once again, I thought there uh, was a band. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it should be. The ocean needs to get on this board. Uh, uh, they started in the last, uh, in the late '90s, early 2000s, and they incorporated hardcore and progressive metal into their uh, initial post-metal sound. I love them. Adrian uh, Guiton says, "I can't, I see others saying it. It needs to be added. Uh, the ocean, and I'm just a luddite here. But does the ocean? Is this? Are they influenced I mean, by ISIS at all, or is oh, oceanic? You mean? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like yeah. I, I listened to the ocean a bit back in the day, but like never again. There's like feels like kind of a minor band. Okay. Um, I, I like I'm not super duper familiar with them, which would make me sound like a philistine. No, it's, uh, but but a key thing to remember here, and and maybe because this is a relatively new genre, albeit you know Godflesh Neurosis." have been around for a while that uh it's always sort of our mandate that the to to to, to enter the canon sure. if you will well, we you have, have to some, have some have level some of, of you like, have to have some yeah. level of influence of course, so yeah. if if a band is too new we don't know if they're really going to put every Banzai records stay, band yeah, on the Wobbum yeah, list yeah. or whatever you know. so would you say they are post metal but perhaps I, I, uh, yeah, haven't I made their mark yet this, yeah. uh, i mean if they've made their mark they ma- they've made it but it's a more minor mark gotcha the ocean. Doesn't every isn't everyone yelling about tool? <laughs> no, they they think the ocean is a great suggestion. Oh, really? No, no, okay. Yeah. Well, here we got more. Mikhail Lopez in the ocean and Internaut, Internaut yeah. have brought prog influences to the genre and expanded an already limitless uh, label as post metal. Delicious dishes says um, the ocean. Great post kind of proggy post metal from Germany and the master niner says that uh, would love to mention the ocean. Perfect combination of progressive metal and post metal. Amazing audiovisual experiences that they deliver and yurt says uh, agree about the ocean yeah. definitely uh should be there well, so yeah i mean i'm it. trying to think like they had that album pre pre cambrian i think okay that was a good record i mean i just think that i mean people are bringing this up but i think it's a little too proggy and i think that like there is a difference between post metal and prog metal uh again it's that difference between structural complexity and complexity complexity you might be getting outnumbered here johnson all right this too is, well, we're is locking also here the, first time. the ocean are not a minor band their album pre cambrian was quite influential when it came out and the unusual structure of the band lineup is uh, uh, notable. Do you know what this unusual I don't know structure? I about that. Okay. Well, I maybe the ocean. Minutes. All right. Maybe we need to exercise. I'll defer some... to the wisdom of the mob. That's how we elected <laughs> Trump, right? Well, this is mean. a three-way show. Not sure the mob ever had great wisdom, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, yes. This is a three-way chart, uh-huh. right? Yes. Sam, banger, yep. guest, right. chat. Yeah. The chat of says course. the ocean. Yeah. Chat. Take it away. Chat rules. You have it. I've, I've, I've elegantly indicated Gorgeous. that the ocean uh, deserves to be in post This is what I like when we get into really a, complex, with, with, yeah, 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 it's, beautiful mind yeah, style. Yeah, it's starting to look like a John Madden Sunday afternoon <laughs> uh, analysis here. Uh, wait a second. You can't ignore it too We're going to talk about this? We're going to talk about in. this. This just in. Heavy metal heretic. You can't ignore Tool. You can, you can deny, deny it, it, but you must bring it up. Okay, happy to. Tool is not a post metal band. <laughs> See ya. So I think what's happening. I like Tool enough. Hang on, Sam Lee. Let's <laughs> let the, it's not that easy. No, on he said course. we could bring it up and then deny it. So why, I, in your opinion, is Tool not a post metal? Again, I think band? if I, you know, Tool to me is like new metal meets prog metal, or like grunge meets prog metal. Right. Uh, I also find the lyrics so annoying a lot of time. I mean, I'm not even really shit talking Tool, who like I generally like. I'm excited for the new album, all that stuff. You know, okay. I love Tool a lot when I was younger, but I don't think they fit the category. Okay, well, if people out there want to see Tool on the post metal chart, you got to speak up. Uh, I mean, they're in other places. They've, <laughs> they've come up in almost every. How many episode. charts can they be? Uh, on? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're on more than one. Yeah. So uh, if you if you sincerely feel that Tool uh, belongs in post metal, uh, time is running short. We've just got a few minutes to go. Well, Lisa. I'll tell you right now, they don't. <laughs> Tool is not a post metal band. I, I think what's happening is that people who don't know this genre, and admittedly, people have said there's a lot of them in the chart this week, uh, in the chat this week. Yep. 
they're like, what about Tool? That's a band I know. Right. Do they fit? Right, I see. It's right. more of a question. Yeah. Because they're bringing it up because it's a reference that they have. Right. I think it's more the fact that John Semley and Lisa Latissou are very well entrenched ideas of where Tool belongs and they're just not going to get I'm not, even like, <laughs> I'm not even hating on Tool. Their fans could probably beat me up. Uh, but I just don't think they're a post-metal band. All right, Lisa. This is that is, it for this week? Um... It might be it for this week. All right. I'm sad. Like I, uh, I was gonna wear my Souls to Fear shirt today, ah. and maybe I should have worn it because then uh, maybe we'd have had some comments for them. Uh, I didn't get a lot of love for Souls to Fear, and um, there otherwise... were bands like Agalock came up. Well, I'll talk about Agalock real yeah. quick. Yeah. Talk about Agalock. Agalock, uh, great band, one of the great American metal bands, I think. But certainly, I count them more as a sort of blackened folk metal thing. Yeah. Uh, an album like The Mantle is like as close as they get to. Pop most metal, um, but I don't think they're quite there. Uh, Souls to Fear fits a bit closer, a little softer, same as some bands like Explosions in the Sky and stuff. Explosions in the Sky I wouldn't call it post metal band. For Lisa, I've put Souls to Fear oh, on the board yeah. at least, because um, it's a good logo. But again, Agalock, amazing band, but I don't think they're quite a post metal band. Okay, well we've got some comments coming here under the wire, we're going to wrap up soon, but Manan Dedia says Tool need to be put next to God. Flesh is a band that predate and acts as an influence on the whole genre. That's an interesting is point. That true, though? Not so sure. Mighty Baxax Axaxa says that Tool are the new King Diamond. I have no idea what. King that Diamond's is. still touring. King Diamond is the new King Diamond. There's nothing new yeah. about King Diamond, and that's what makes King Diamond rule. Uh, yeah. End of story. Uh, Lisa, are we good? Uh, yeah, um, I gotta really <laughs> actually. Some of the tool is pretentious enough to uh -huh. be on here. Yeah, uh -huh. but they're pretentious in the wrong way. <laughs> um, <laughs> we we do have a comment that uh, I think is good for us to include when we talk about the future. Okay. Uh, both for this genre yep. and for Lockhorns, like sure. where we go next from this chart. Yep. Okay. Uh, which is uh, from Alejandro Ochoa. Ochoa. Here we go. Alejandro says definitively the genre is alive. The first wave of bands is still lurking. The addition of the post-black metal scene should be considered in a different episode. Mm -hmm. Many of the so-called post-metal bands should be mixed with the post-rock movement. Bands like Explosions in the Sky and Godspeed Black uh, Emperor could fit some of their songs and melodies in this category. Look at the labels that promote these bands like Hydra Head and uh, Temporary Residence. So. Right. I mean, I would agree with a lot of that. I think uh, black gaze or post-black metal is totally considered its own thing or should be considered its own thing. Yeah. Again, just sort of in the genealogy, a lot of this stuff comes out of sludge, comes out of hardcore, comes out of that sort of growlier American metal sound. Mm -hmm. I love a lot of these bands. You know, Def Heaven put out a great record one time. Uh, Oathbreaker, great band. Merker, very experimentally right. uh, ambient sounding stuff in places. Wolves in the Throne Room even, but not post-metal. Um, and I do agree. I think that, like, personally, as a mm -hmm. fan, I'm almost more interested in the sort of black gay stuff these, right. these days in a lot of cases, because the problem when you pride bands on innovating and being new and being fresh yep. is that it's easy for them to not do that. Like, even the past few Neurosis records, I don't want to sound like a heretic, but have been, like, a little stale and boring and samey for me. Right, right. Uh, so I think, in that sense, the genre is alive or is sort of splitting off into this sort of black gazy territory right. in certain it's, respects. it's spawning some other And that's all post Death Heaven, post everybody liking black metal, right. you know, whatever. You can't do anything about that. Right. Well, there we go. <laughs> all right, we got, uh, this is the last gasp honorable mentions list. Nicholas Adaviano says we, we still need to discuss Under Oath and, and, and Deaf Heaven. Well, I just talked about Deaf Heaven, I guess. Oh, someone said Rosetta. Rosetta's a good band. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, not necessarily big enough. Uh, Deaf Heaven, I don't think, is a post-metal band. I think that like the word, in the same way that you could say the word post-metal was invented to describe neurosis, the word black gaze was invented to describe Deaf Heaven right. and bands like Deaf Heaven. Right. So I would not call them a post-metal band. I'm happy to come in another time and talk about black gaze or even right. you know, create another branch for that. Uh, but would not say so. All Cest, someone else brought up. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Would they go on that chart? I don't think so. Again, Black Gaze, Black Gazy. Right. Sometimes, like, not their last album, but the one before that just sounded like a Cedar Rose album or right. something. Right. So I guess that's sort of post-Rocky. Uh, but no, it's not a post-metal band. Well, to sum it up for me, I will say that I know... 100% times more about post metal than about an hour ago. So thank you Always uh, good to be for here. that. Uh, John Semley. Uh, Lisa, do we have a winning comment 
of the week, do you think? People were so nice. I know, I know. Oh, I thought, these guys are saying Blink-182. <laughs> <laughs> There's the comment of the week. Someone said Blink-182 is a post-metal band uh, most uh, preposterous. Well, thank you for joining us on Lockhorns. Thank you to Lisa, Daniel, Craig, and Andrew. Uh, reminder to follow us on Apple Music and please subscribe mm. to Banger uh, TV. Next week, uh, Lockhorns <laughs> is back uh, with... Uh, we're all winners, apparently. We're all winners. Uh, prog Metal. <laughs> Uh, essential albums and it'll be a debate with uh, Dylan Gowan of uh, Vesperia so uh, thanks again for joining us on Lockhorns and we'll see you next time